can we really manage our genes? I mean, all of us who had any schooling on this matter were taught definitively that genetic risk factors were risk factors that were unmodifiable. You see, that's what we were taught. But something happened about 10 years ago. In, in 2003, the Human Genome Project was completed. Scientists were actually able to decode the entire human genome from start to finish. It was an amazing accomplishment. So, uh, just, just 20 years ago, scientists would have scoffed at the idea that we would ever have access to the entire decoded human genome. This has ushered into, uh, us into a new era. Many of us don't notice it yet because it, it can take 30 years for scientific information to trickle down into actual clinical application, where, where doctors and health professionals are actually taking advantage of the information that's available. Well, I refuse to wait 30 years. How about you? I want to take advantage of the information that comes out in the last year that's available for us to make a huge difference in our health. We are now into an age, if we choose to, to participate in what we call personalized medicine, where, where no longer do we have to just uh, succumb to a system that does statistical averages and treats us as if we're exactly like everybody else. We now have the potential to be treated as a biologically, genetically, biochemically individual, somebody that is unique in so many different ways. And that is what's really necessary for us to take the next step in optimizing our health. And I'm excited about this very potential. So we're, we're now in a, in a new age, but you see, our, our past training on this has created a mentality, has created a, a belief that, you know, I've got bad genes, so therefore, because it's unmodifiable, I really can't do anything about it, and I'm just going to deal with it. Or, more typically, I'm not going to do anything about it because it doesn't matter what I do. It's genetic. I have had patients tell me, uh, as I go through their family history and their medical history, and, and they have clearly taken the time to work it all out, and they say, oh, don't worry about this one this risk factor, because, because it's familial. Have you ever heard that term? Familial meaning that it is inherited through the family tree. That's the way grandpa was, that's the way dad was, and that's the way I'm going to be. I'm going to chip off the old block. <laughs> now, there's, there's good things about being a chip off the old block, but there's also bad things then the good news is that we don't have to succumb to these familial inherited conditions because now we have access to information on how we can actually manage our genes. We can now, through our choices, through, through a, a willingness to study, to evaluate, to test our genetic risk, we can now do something about that. Now, why is this important to me. You see, because if we believe that you have bad, I have bad genes, the whole idea is this, this, this uh, popular song, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, right? Uh, if we believe that, that, that we've just been dealt this hand of cards and that's all we have to play with, that we really can't do anything else about that, then we are not going to be actively participating in trying to change that and trying to improve our health beyond our genetic inheritance. You see, a lot of us think that we're just predetermined and that, when that we just need to accept the way we are and, 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 and others just need to accept the way we are because it's genetic. Well, 
I'll tell you why I'm so interested in this. When I was 10 years old, my parents were Christian missionaries in, in South America. We're living in Bolivia at the time, beautiful country. We're, we're actually living in the, in the valley, but it was at 8,500 feet above sea level. It was, we had 17,000 foot mountains surrounding us in the valley. It was a beautiful place to live. And I remember watching my mother go out to the eucalyptus groves and, and, and she would play the guitar and, and just meditate and just look up at the mountains. She loved the mountains. But I didn't know that she was depressed. You know, a 10-year-old kid doesn't really pay attention to things like that. Plus, uh, parents don't oftentimes let on to kids what's really going on inside. Well, uh, when I was 10 years old, my father came home early one afternoon, and that was a shocker because my brother and I rarely saw my father in the afternoon. He was always busy in, in his work as a, as a college uh, president, uh, overseeing so many committees and classes. And, um, and, and so we stopped playing catch and looked at my father uh, walk into the house. And as we ran up to him, we realized that he was crying. We had rarely, if ever, seen my father cry. And so instantly, we just started crying too. It just because it was like a knee-jerk reaction. And, and, uh, and, and then through my father's tearful eyes, he explained to us that mom was really sick and that we couldn't stay in Bolivia anymore. We had, in fact, we only had 20 minutes to leave. And so, not knowing what else to do with the shock of, of this new reality in our lives, I simply packed my baseball glove and my baseball, and, and pretty much that's all I took with me back from South America. We just left everything. We were in a hurry. We wanted to get on the first plane out of there because a, a radiologist at one of the new Catholic hospitals in Cochabamba had, had, had done an x-ray on my mom's head and said, you need to get your wife out of here immediately. We cannot do anything for her. You need to get her back to the States. Well, to make a long story short, my, my uncle, Dr. S Dr. Russell Youngberg, a physician in Pennsylvania, drove to New York City, picked us up right on the tarmac. We landed, and we didn't have, even have to go to the gate. He was right there with, with a, a car ready to pick us all up and and to rush us away to a hospital where my mother would receive surgical treatment for glioblastoma. She was given four to six weeks to live. She's a fighter. She lived nine months. <sighs> Two years later, and some of you have heard this story before, but this is critical to understanding of, of the power of genomic medicine that's available to us today. It was not available to us even 10 years ago. It's available to us today. The question is, are we going to take advantage of that? Or we're just going to walk away and say, oh, that was interesting. Well, two years later, I was 13 years old, and, and my father and I were raking leaves one autumn afternoon in Barron Springs, Michigan. And as we, as we were talking, hour after hour, little by little, there was a lot of leaves <laughs> in Michigan, Little by little, our conversation turned from the typical mundane conversation from the White Sox and the Chicago Bears to important things. And I stopped and asked, I said, Dad, why did mom have to, why did she have to die of cancer? Why did she have all these health problems? Uh, how come I didn't know she had depression? Why wasn't something done about that? And I remember him leaning on his rake and just looking down Greenfield Drive, just a mile from Andrews University, small Christian university in, in Michigan near, near the lake. And as he looked, he just was trying to think of what to say to me. A little bit of time went by and I finally said, Dad, I wish I knew right now what was, what, what's going on inside my body, what, was placing, what is placing me at risk for disease, for illness, so I could start doing something about it right now. And without realizing it, that was the watershed moment, that was the pivotal point in my life that changed my path. 
in my passion towards understanding not just the superficial aspects of healthcare, not just things that make people feel a little bit better as they continue to get sicker, not palliative care, but, but a type of health care that addresses the root cause. So I've always been searching for a, a deeper and deeper foundation associated with health. And now we're in that era. We have the opportunity to actually take advantage of our own genetic information and how that impacts our risk for future disease. I want to take advantage of it. You see, you see most disease-promoting genes do not or, or uh, only determine a predisposition. They do not determine the likelihood of the disease itself. It's the choices that we make. It's, it's our behaviors. It's our lifestyle that has the, the largest influence on what happens with these aberrant genes that we may carry, that we may have inherited. In close physical proximity to our actual genes, our coding sequences within the genome that are not genes themselves, but they are master switches that actually can turn the genes next to it on or off. I like to refer to it as a dimmer switch because you see, uh, there's so many factors that influence whether or not that genetic mutation, that aberrant gene that we carry, and we all carry them, we all carry, not the same ones, but we all carry many, many aberrant genes, genetic mutations that place us at risk if we choose not to do anything about it. But see, next to these genes are these coding sequences that actually influence whether that disease-causing gene, maybe for diabetes, maybe for certain types of cancer, maybe for heart disease or rheumatoid arthritis, you name it, those genes can be turned down like a squelch dial, drop, drop down, so that it becomes less and less and less and less and less likely to cause any problem. But likely, likewise, through maybe unhealthy choices that we make through, through our diet, through our attitude, through our choices, through our various behaviors, can actually turn that coding sequence up, 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 up. So that master switch is now turning on that disease-causing gene. This is real critical information because that means that we have control over our genes, if we choose to. This brings up another, another very interesting idea of what we call genetic drift. See, we're all born with genes that we inherited exclusively from our mother and father. We are a uniquely created individual or procreated individual that comes 50% from each mother and father. That's our genome. But what a lot of people don't really understand, or at least fully understand, is that we also inherit their epigenome. We also inherit the, the, all these switches, all these coding sequences that, that are over the lifetime of our parents have been set in certain positions. They've either been turned up and turning on that good or bad gene, or they've been turned down, turning off, tending to turn off that good or bad gene. So we actually inherit that tendency as well from our parents. But over time, the choices that we make trump, over, overcome, and neutralize that epigenetic in that epigenetic information from our parents, and it starts to be molded by the choices that we're making. Very exciting. So, so here's an example. Here's, here's uh, two ladies who are identical twins, age 66. 
just looking at them uh, at a social gathering, you would think, wow, you know, th these are genetic twins, and, and they're going to end up having a very similar life because they're genetically identical. But in fact, one of these ladies has a terminal illness, and the other is optimally well. Genetically identical, but epigenetically very, very different. And so researchers over the last decade have been very interested in this phenomena, and they've actually been able to go to the library, or go, to the, go to the scientific laboratory, not the genetic library yet, and they have been able to not only test the, gene, the genome, the genes themselves, the physical genes, and of course, in these two ladies, the genes are identical for their entire lives. But the way those genes are turned on and turned off be, basically become very different over time. As you can see on the left hand of the slides, the, the epigenome is very similar. It's, it's, it's very more almost identical. But over the decades, the expression of the very same genes has changed dramatically as seen by the big waves in those lines. Okay, so we have a genome and we have an epigenome. So it's, um, it's, under, it's key to understand then that it is lifestyle, the choices that we make that actually throw the switch or cause that dimming activity in that gene either up or down, upregulated or downregulated risk for disease. So researchers have estimated, and this is a very conservative figure, that at least 70% of our health outcome depends not on the gene that we inherited, but what we do about that gene that we inherited. That's good news. That means that we have the largest level of control. The choices that we make have the largest level of control of our genes. So if our genes are the cards that we're dealt, then epigenetics is how we play them, how we utilize them. So here's an example. Uh, here's an individual who, who participated in Dr. Dean Ornish's prostate cancer trial. You see, one of, one of the cancers that most men are sure to get at some point in their life is prostate cancer. We know that, that uh, by the age of, of 80 or 80 plus, the vast majority of men already have some type of prostate cancer, but it's so slow growing that, there's, that it will never be the factor that causes premature death or disability to the man, usually. But see, now we're starting to understand that that doesn't have to be an invariable aspect of aging for males. Just like breast cancer doesn't have to be uh, uh, a, a factor that eventually will happen to many females. We have the potential to change that. So let's take a look at this study. Can I modify the genes that I have that place me at risk for prostate cancer or women for breast cancer or colon cancer or whatever it might be? Can we modify those genes? And, and the answer is absolutely, we can modify those. And here was a study done by Dr. Dean Ornish a few years ago. And what he did is he took a group of men, all of which had been diagnosed with prostate cancer. And what he did is he initially did a biopsy of the prostate gland. And via that biopsy was able to measure over 500 known genes, many of which are known to cause disease and many of which are known to be able to prevent disease. Then he placed them on a plant-based diet, moderate exercise, on a stress management program. We're going to be learning today why is it that stress... Is, is so frequently a precursor to major illness in our lives. It's, as I take medical histories on patients, I frequently see that it was an episode of stress that basically threw the switch. See, that's an epigenetic phenomenon. When we're under a tremendous amount of stress, that is what turns up 
the epigenetic risk and turns on the gene that causes the problem. Now, stress is not going to cause the same problem in every person. We're past this age of statistical medicine. It's the psychological stress or any type of stress increases our risk for what we are already genetically susceptible to, which is unique to you, which is unique to me. So we need to understand that. So, the, so a, a stress management program was provided for these people that included a weekly support group where they were able to talk about what was going on in their lives. As a side note, over 20 years ago now, a group of researchers at University of California, San Francisco, took a group of women who had been diagnosed with terminal breast cancer. They all had been told that there was no chance of them being able to beat this. Kind of a harsh thing to do, especially nowadays. We should never, never tell somebody there's no chance, okay? because there's always some chance. And, and But all they did for this group, this one group of women, is they just once a week got together in a support group so that they could bear their soul. Just talk to each other. Do you know that, that although the, the women in the control group received exactly the same type of medical care, the very best medical care available through the UC system, that the group who just sat down together for once, once a week for an hour lived twice as long on average as the group who did not. Psychological, emotional, and spiritual factors are powerful and, in fact, can be the very trump cards over other factors as well. So they did this for just three months, these men with prostate cancer. At the end of three months, Dr. Ornish had his research team do another biopsy of the prostate gland, and this is what they found. It was amazing. They found that of the 453 genes that promoted cancer, and disease that were turned on at the beginning of the study three months before, now they were all turned in the opposite direction. They had all been turned down. The switch had been thrown towards the opposition. They also found that of the 48 genes that were known to be able to activate healing properties within the human system that had been turned off at the beginning of the pro program, were now all turned on, had been, the dim switch had been twisted in the, in the clockwise direction dramatically. Wow. So that's an example of epigenetics. That's an example of how we have control over our genes. A, a, a quick reminder for some of you is the story of the fast yellow mouse where uh, researchers at Duke University were able to take these, these uh, mutated mice. These are mice that are well-known to researchers called the agouti mice that uh, have a gene, an aberrant mutated gene that actually causes the normal brown coat of the mouse to turn yellow. They become uh, obese very quickly, going on to get diabetes, heart disease, and many of them dying of cancer prematurely. So uh, what the doctors at Duke University did is they started giving these fat yellow mama mice super nutrients. The type of nutrients I'm going to be sharing with you today, they actually create what we call a nutrigenomic bypass of that gene mutation. We're not just talking about a changing the way the gene works in a favorable way, which is critical and a, a key insight for us to appreciate, but we can actually even bypass the gene mutation itself if we know where that mutation is. That is exciting. And so by, by giving, giving special super nutrients in the, in the form of activated folate, in the form of special genistein or special um, nutrients found in, in plants and soy, they actually turned off that gene completely. And now... These fat yellow mama mice that were always giving birth to fat, yellow-coated, diabetic, uh, uh, heart attack-prone, cancer-prone mice, now 
they come out with a brown, uh, within a, one generation, they have a brown coat, lean, did not develop any of the diseases. And what's exciting is that these two mice have exactly the same genes. They're genetically identical in every way. But epigenetically, very different. Why? Because, well, in this case, it's the choices of the researchers. Because, because the, the researchers gave the right nutrient to these genetically mutated mice, they now had the opportunity to live a long, healthy mouse life compared to suffering through chronic disease the majority of their lives. Now, this isn't just a story for mice. This is a story of mice and men. <laughs> this is a story for you and I to take advantage of. You see, um, we, have, we have the opportunity to change our epigenome. And, and this is now ushering in the era of nutrigenomics, okay? The influence of nutrition on genes, both epigenetically and providing a bypass fix on the actual mutation itself. This is profoundly exciting to me because now I can actually directly recommend a gene test that I suspect may be present. And when we find that, we know that biologically, genetically, you are unique, and now we know exactly how that gene is influencing certain aspects of your health. We don't have to guess anymore. We know exactly what the most foundational aspect of health risk can be. Now, there's a lot of things we don't understand yet from the Human Genome Project. Just because they've decoded the entire genome doesn't mean that we have all the application yet. We don't. This will, this will be a developing field for many decades to come. But we have enough information right now to make a powerful, a powerful change, transformation in our genetic risk. So the power of food to alter our genetic expression, nutrigenomics. So let's, let's, let's take a look at this. So who or what... <laughs> is in charge of my genes, right? It's not the dry cleaner. <laughs> it's, not, it's not our mom or, or our wife or spouse who takes care of the laundry, okay? It's, it's us if we choose to. See, a lot of us are not willing to become the stewards of our own body. It's too much responsibility. It's too hard. It's too challenging. But let's see. Now, uh, if any of you have ever taken biochemistry in high school or college, um, you have at least, at least once or twice seen a chart like this and quickly flipped the page. <laughs> uh, there, there are some maybe amongst us right now that have the type of ability to memorize things like this. I, I've, I've known people who I went to school with, they could just sit down in their room for a couple hours and memorize all the pathways and remember them, okay? I was never like that. I was more always looking for a reason behind this information. Now we have a reason to understand this. It's not just the biochemists in the laboratory that can use this information now. We can use it in a clinical practice. To, but, but this is kind of the, the bird's eye view. It seems chaotic, and how can we make any sense of it? But now this becomes a little bit more manageable to understand. You, you start to see in, uh, that, that there are genes that influence the production of enzymes at every metabolic pathway in our body. You see... Our genes, in our, in our human genome, they are essentially codes. They are templates. They make things. And your cell is essentially a manufacturing plant for taking information from your genes, using that as the master plan, and actually designing a structure, a protein, that then gets used maybe as an enzyme, 
And what we see here in these metabolic pathways in our body are, are many enzymes that could become dysfunctional. Actually, they don't become dysfunctional. They are dysfunctional if, in fact, we inherited a gene that is slightly mutated, meaning that it now is a template that generates proteins and structures within our cells that are dysfunctional. They're, they don't work the way God originally intended that enzyme to work. And, and this, unfortunately, is occurring in all of us. This is something that is going on in all of us. In fact, there's certain genes where, where we have lost, that, that are mutated in such a way that we have literally lost 90% of the capacity to produce certain metabolic pathways effectively. And so what happens, it's, it's very similar to driving down the 15, and then there's, there's a cigular, there's a car right in the fast lane that ran out of gas, or who knows what happened to that car, or had a fender bender, and is sitting there in the fast lane. What is that going to do to traffic? And what is that going to do to your ability to get from point A to point C in a timely fashion? It's going, to, it's going to dramatically increase or decrease the efficiency of that highway, of that pathway, and it's going to make it real, much harder for you to get from point A and point C. That's what's happening in our metabolic pathways. When we have, a, when we have one copy of this gene mutation, and we get, we get potentially one copy from mom and one copy from dad, most of us on some of these common mutations will have, well, 40% in, in one common mutation on how we use folic acid effectively in our body. 40% of us have one copy of that mutation, which, which means that, interestingly, we have a 60% decrease effectiveness in the activation of folic acid in our body so that we can properly use this. So what a lot of us have thought in the past, well, if you just take more folic acid supplementally, that'll just produce more activated folate. But it's not true. And we'll see here along the way how that works, that, that there are so many pathways where there's mutations. One mutation from one parent can decrease that pathway by 60%. If we have one mutation from both parents, that can decrease the pathway up to 70 and 90%. Which means that if we have any other environmental risk factor, if we have an exposure to toxins in our life, which unfortunately all of us are exposed to toxins, but if we, have, if we carry some of these metabolic mutations, now even low levels of toxins that other people can handle without apparent problems becomes a serious issue for you in your health because you can't get rid of them properly. You can't detoxify them effectively due to this mutation. So let's, let's keep looking at this. Here's, here's maybe a little bit easier to understand. It's, it's um, showing that there, there are gene mutations and one of them is called the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase gene. Think of it as the mother-father gene because you get one copy from the mother and one copy from the father. It's actually, it's actually called the MTHFR gene, an acronym for short, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. But this MTHFR gene is mutated in we have 40% of us have one copy of that mutation. Another 30% of us have two copies of that mutation. And scientists have now understood that this gene alone has over 50 known genetic mutation variants. Wow. You know, in other words, we are all mutants. I had this test done myself. And initially, to my chagrin, I discovered I was a mutant until I realized that I should have expected that. 
right? I mean, what kind of ego do I have to have to think that I'm not a mutant? We are all mutants genetically. But here's the good news. We have an opportunity to change the way that mutation affects our body. Now, this is getting a little bit simpler, is we can see that at the very core of these four cogs, you see, if, 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 there, if there is a, a problem, if there is an interference with any one of these cogs, the entire machine shuts down or starts to grind to a halt. And right at the very center of, of all four of these major metabolic pathways in the body, the, the methylation cycle, the folate cycle, the, the uh, uh, tetrahydrobiopterin cycle, and the urea cycle. Right in the core, in the middle of this, is this, is this gene mutation, this MTHFR mutation, that when mutated, basically codes for an enzyme by the same name that doesn't work right. And this enzyme creates an inability to activate this vitamin folate. And without an ability to activate it, folate is actually harmful to us because it starts backing up and building up in the body. And we get so much of this unmetabolized folic acid in our blood that it's an irritant. It's actually toxic to the body. So what's interesting is that when, when we have, when we check blood levels of vitamin B12 or folate, and the levels are high, many people are thinking, oh, this is great, my vitamin B12 and my folate is high. But actually what that could mean is that we're not processing that vitamin. It's building up, and we're not actually making the active, most important aspect of that vitamin. You see, so these blood tests have to be properly interpreted. And, and so uh, having... Having this MTHFR mutation basically creates a, a chain reaction of events that places us at risk for whatever we are already genetically predisposed to. That's why the list of conditions that's associated with this gene mutation is so long, I didn't even put a slide up. Because whatever you're thinking, whatever health concern you might have is probably related to that. But more specifically... This is strongly related to mental health. It's strongly related to neurologic health, uh, to how healthy our nerves are. It's strongly related to reproductive health uh, with regards to uh, tendency to birth defects, miscarriage, infertility, and birth defects. It's, it's strongly related to heart disease, blood clotting, stroke risk, on and on. And so these are important pathways. So let's take a look at one of those. Um, Dr. Stahl uh, from the University of, of uh, California, San Diego, did an interesting study a few years ago. And it basically, he was showing that understanding this metabolic pathway relative to this MTHFR mutation and inability to activate folate, vitamin B9, it actually can be one of the main factors that leads to depression. Because, see, if we don't have the activated form of folate, of folate what happens is that we cannot generate the neurotransmitters that allow us to feel good. Now, it's important to understand here that one gene mutation does not a disease make, okay? In other words, just simply having one gene mutation doesn't mean that you're always going to respond having problems. What this means is that all other things being equal, we are now at greater risk because there's actually hundreds and thousands of genes that can be mutated. We have over 20,000 known genes in the human body. It's roughly around 20,000. And and chances are most of those genes have the potential to be mutated in some way, which slightly alters our risk every time we have a mutation. And some of the, the, the alterations are dramatic. So, so what Dr. Stahl showed is that, for instance, the very top left uh, circle is, uh, is representative of folic acid. 
Folic acid is always synthetic. It is something that is man-made. It is something that is added to the enrichment process of, of processed refined foods. And so if, if we got mugged uh, going home tonight and we had $1,000 in our wallet, uh, and after getting beat up and laying on the, on the, on the uh, asphalt, uh, the, uh, the, the, the thief, the perpetrator, grabs a couple dollar bills and throws them out the window and says, here, you know, make a phone call, and drives off. Would you feel enriched? That is exactly what's happening with the enrichment process of, of fortified foods. It's providing a nutrient that may be helpful, but in 70% of the population who has at least one copy of this MTHFR mutation, that folic acid actually becomes mildly toxic. And that's why studies in the last few years have been showing that if you're taking regular folic acid as a, in your multiple supplement, which 99% have that in it, you're actually increasing your risk for cancer, for breast cancer in women, prostate cancer in men, and colon cancer in both. And that's the beginning of the research on this. And so that's why we need to make sure that we're getting the right type of nutrients for the right type of nutrigenomic genetic bypass to occur. And so the very first uh, circle there denotes folic acid. It's always synthetic, and that requires an enzyme in our body to convert it into folate. Now, unfortunately, on labels, folic acid is frequently referred to as folate, but it is not. So it becomes a little bit difficult. So, so that's why do not believe it when they say folate that it is actually folate. It's probably 99% of the time regular folic acid. Well, now that, fo that whole food folate that's in your, in your greens and your fruits and, and uh, beans and whole grains, that whole food folate needs now, needs three more separate genes and respective enzymes to break down or add structures to that folate to turn it into the activated form. And see, and what happens is that between, between the third and the fourth reaction that leads to that final orange representative methylfolate form of vitamin, that's where the gene mutation is for MTHFR. And so that's why we need to pay attention to this. And that's why it's, it's so important is it influences so many, many factors in our health. Now, that this slide simply shows is that we have to pay attention to biochemical individuality because each colored tag on this biochemical chart represents a separate gene that we know frequently gets mutated. And this is just an example, kind of the tip of the iceberg, about 22 different genes that we know we can actually measure now and figure out how each of those genes influences our future potential to heal or to, to age more rapidly. <clears throat> now, Dr. Stahl and his research in San Diego showed that, that just this one of, of hundreds of potential mutations, when present, actually influences the production of three critical neurotransmitters in our brain. Number one, the, the activation of methylfolate through this gene is critical for the production of serotonin, converting uh, L, L tryptophan into 5-HTP into, into serotonin. Well, we need serotonin to have a healthy outlook, to have a good mood. Serotonin is important for so many things. Now, what's interesting here is that so many of the medications that are being used today to, to uh, make us feel better mood-wise, the SSRIs, the selective serotonin uh, uh, uptake inhibitors, 
okay? Uh, the, uh, re the receptor inhibitors. These SSRIs basically don't make more serotonin. They just simply slow down the breakdown of serotonin in the brain. And so, so that allows the serotonin to stay a little higher. But it can take up to three months for these prescription medications to actually kick in long enough to maintain a reasonable level of serotonin in the blood. And of course, now we're dealing with side effects. Fast forward, though, Human Genome Project. Now we know that the actual determining factor on how much serotonin you can make is in PHFR and the ability to methylate or activate folate. And now that activated folate easily produces adequate serotonin. That is exciting. I, I, I was very interested in a presentation by, by Dr. Neil Rollins, an OBGYN physician who um, uh, one day uh, got a call from, from uh, a leader of a mission group that had taken, taken a group of college students, including his son, to, to Chile to do a mission uh, project. And, and this, this uh, coordinator of the mission project said, your son Wesley is terribly ill. We have no idea what's wrong. The doctors here, had, they just say, you've got to get him out of here. And they had to medevac him from Chile to the United States. And, and then he got the very best care possible for his son. And nothing, nothing that uh, was tested, that was evaluated, came up with any idea of why his son had to basically be in bed without any strength for 23 and a half hours a day. He could barely get up for 15 minutes, and after that, his energy was spent. He had to sleep for another 23 hours. It was a horrible, and he was dying. He was getting worse and worse and worse. And so Dr. Rollins, even though he was an OB-GYN, he said, I'm, I, I have to figure this out myself. You know, I went through medical school. I'm going to start, I'm going to start trying to figure this out. And so as, as he studied this for himself, he discovered that he could actually test certain genes that related to this. And, and so he decided he'd test himself first. And he found out that he was, he had a double copy of that main mutation, MTHFR, which meant that he was 90% ineffective in producing this. But see, his son had been exposed to something, some toxins, some bacteria, something that had made him so weak that now his... His double mutation that he got from his dad was, was holding him down. He could not get better. As soon as they introduced methylfolate to this young college student, within one day he was up and around and very quickly regained his health psychologically and physically. Wow. He was, and so he, uh, he lectures all around the country on this. Uh, uh, just, you know, because when a father finds something that so miraculously is able to bring his son back from certain death, he wants to make sure other people are aware of it. And, and so uh, Dr. Rollins, in fact, uh, has, has found that in his patients who have horrible depression, that simply testing them appropriately in this broad set of genes and then treating them can within a week's time bring them back to a position of psychological health that they haven't had for decades. 90% of the time, basically negating the need for additional medications. Um, another two key pathways here that we want to mention is that, that this gene it codes for the production of dopamine. So without a proper pathway, to produce dopamine, we're sitting there. Dopamine is critical for brain health. It's critical for mood regulation. And it's, it's critical, especially for those people who tend to be, have uncontrollable cravings, they tend to be uh, addictive personalities. They're the ones that are most likely to have problems with these metabolic pathways because they can't make enough dopamine unless they're smoking or drinking or taking drugs. 
Because see, these drugs temporarily uh, increase dopamine. So they feel, they just feel normal for a little while. See, never, never, never look down at people who have addictions. There's a reason they have addictions. Never turn them away. Because, because they're missing something that you don't, that, that you have. They don't have it. And they're, they're just trying to feel normal like you and I by using these, these drugs. But what we need to do is find what the actual foundational problem is. And so now they can have a choice to move away from the dysfunction of their previous life. Another key pathway here is, is the production of norepinephrine and adrenaline. And so you see that if we can't produce neurotransmitters effectively, we're going to be struggling. We're going to have mood issues. We're going to, we're going to have behavioral issues. We're more likely to even have problems with violence. It becomes harder to do the right thing when we have these mutations. Another aspect of mutations is that... Is that Having inadequate methyl or active folate dramatically increases the risk of miscarriages, stillbirths, and, and according to Dr. Rollins, he believes, and he's already, he's already petitioned the FDA, he's petitioned many organizations, said, if we could just make sure that women, instead of getting a prenatal with folic acid in it, especially since we know that 70% of all women have at least one mutation in this area, why not give them methylfolate? I mean, once you understand this, it's a no-brainer. But to change policy, it took 50 years for the government to, to actually provide folic acid to women to prevent neural tube defect and, and anencephaly problems. But how many years is it going to take before we actually change that to the right type of folate? Who knows? But you and I, we have the opportunity to do that now. Everybody, I believe, should only use methylfolate. Well, almost everybody should use methylfolate exclusively, uh, certainly compared to the synthetic form. So he, Dr. Rollins says that if, if women in their prenatals were to use methylfolate instead of regular folic acid, that in itself, could decrease congenital heart defects by over 50%. Boom. Can you imagine the power? And this is a, a genetic bypass. It's not changing the fact you have that, that mutation. It's changing the impact of that mutation on your health. Okay, so let's look at another aspect here. Vitamin D. Those of you who, um, uh, who know me, you know that I like to talk about vitamin D. Okay, I, I've been testing every single patient for vitamin D since, since the Harvard researcher first established that the level of vitamin D in our blood has, uh, has greater power over cancer than whether or not you smoke. That's how powerful vitamin D is. We, not, not that if, you know, if your vitamin D is good that you can smoke all you want. Of course, that would be foolish. Okay, we're talking about... We're talking about that we need to consider strongly what our vitamin D level is. Now, what's interesting is that just simply measuring our vitamin D level and, and then adjusting our vitamin D appropriate through sun exposure and proper supplementation isn't by itself enough. There is actually a gene mutation that is very common that, re, that actually changes the impact of vitamin D. You see, because vitamin D is a critical vitamin in the production of dopamine. So see, now you have methylfolate is one pathway to make folate, make dopamine. But now vitamin D is another pathway to make dopamine. I, I can't tell you how many patients I've talked to. So as soon as they started taking vitamin D supplementally, wow, the brain just kind of came alive. It didn't happen to me. You know, I just, I, I, I take it because I know it's good for me. I didn't, I didn't notice any, whew, I feel much better now psychologically. But that, that, that's because I have my own unique set of mutations, which are different than your set of mutations, okay? We still have to understand those individually. You see, so vitamin D is necessary for the production of dopamine in the brain, one of the key neurotransmitters, for improving mood, for optimizing mood, but also for immune function. 
You see, without adequate dopamine and vitamin D, what happens is our ability to defend against toxins in the environment, against heavy metals like mercury, lead, and arsenic, is, uh, becomes very difficult. And, and don't think that you're not exposed to mercury, lead, and arsenic. We are all exposed to mercury, lead, and arsenic every day. Okay? And by the way, that's one, one key reason why we want to shift our diet towards um, a more vegan diet. Why? Because the more vegan we become, the less exposure we get to heavy metals. You know, that one of the, one of the biggest arguments against using chicken in our diet, which is, of course, the choice for people that are moving away from red meat, right? They just, oh, no, I don't, I don't stay, I don't eat red meat. I hear that all the time. I eat chicken. And so sometimes I, I, I wonder if I, if I should pop their bubble by talking about the amount of arsenic in chicken. Now, I wish chicken did not have arsenic in it. I wish that were true. But unless it's certified organic, um, and, and, I, sh and, and I, I should say uh, a certified veganic, really, <laughs> which means that, that even, even the... Um, um, the foods that they eat, like the rice that they eat, was not grown in a soil that had chicken manure, right? Because if it has chicken manure in it, guess what's in that? Arsenic. Well, where does this arsenic come from? It, it comes from an FDA-approved adding of arsenic to chicken feed. In fact, it, it, this became such a big issue where about a year ago, the FDA said, well, why don't you kind of voluntarily stop adding arsenic to chicken feed? And I'm going like, voluntarily? You mean it's okay if they want to? Now, why would they want to? Because arsenic helps the chickens grow up and get fat and juicy. Why? Because arsenic kills bacteria. It kills bacteria, it kills microbes, and so these chickens don't get sick, and they grow fast. Quick turnaround for profits, Right? That's a wonderful thing, except, see, that we're not getting fattened for the market. If we were be, it'd be no problem. If we were being fattened for the market, then we'd never get old enough to suffer the neurologic consequences of eating arsenic. Okay, but so that, that's what happens to us is when we're exposed to lots of years of eating chicken that has arsenic in it. So that's just one example. We're all exposed to all these heavy metals. And so, so when we have low vitamin D, our ability to get rid of, detoxify these heavy metals really drops down. And our ability to fight infections drops down as well. And of course, infections and toxins are two of the key reasons why so many people are developing diabetes. And that's why I have a whole chapter in my book, Goodbye Diabetes, that actually talks about addressing hidden culprits. It's not, diabetes is not just a question of controlling your blood sugars. You know, we, anybody can control their blood sugars if they use enough strategies and enough medication. But see, that's not the key. The key is dealing with the underlying cause of the problem that actually leads to all the other pathologies associated with diabetes. So we want to pay attention to vitamin D. But it's important to realize that Today, we know that at least 2,000 out of our 20,000 genes, that's one out of every 10 genes that we have in our entire body, are controlled to a large degree by vitamin D. Oof. Make sure you test your vitamin C, make sure vitamin D, and make sure that you treat it properly. Now, what's interesting is that many of us actually have what's called a VDR tag. This is the vitamin D receptor mutation. Now, you'll see, you see this plus slash forward slash minus. That plus means there's one copy of that mutation. If it was a plus plus, that means you have two copies of that mutation, one from each parent. And of course, a double mutation is called a homozygous mutation, means that you're in serious trouble when it comes to the effectiveness of that enzyme that is coded by that gene. And so, in other words, your body's ability to use vitamin D effectively just went downhill real fast. 
And that's why it's even more important for those of us with that mutation to supplement aggressively with vitamin D. Why? Because we have a mutation in the ability to use it effectively. And of course, there's other cofactors. There's other nutrients that relate to, to how that is being properly used. So, so mutations in this VDR gene cause defects in the critical receptors for vitamin D in every cell. See, every cell of our body needs vitamin D. And we need to make sure it gives adequate amounts. And see, and so now we can't produce the dopamine uh, very well, and, and we become more susceptible to the toxins, the metals, and the microbes. So since 90% of the population either has low or very low normal vitamin D levels, Never, never allow somebody to tell you, oh, your vitamin D is just is in a normal range. I always insist that you get the number, and I always insist that you ask what the actual range is. The, the reference, quote, normal range for vitamin D is 30 to 100. That's a huge range. And if we have any genetic t uh, mutation tendencies, we want to be in the upper end of that range, not anywhere near that lower part of that normal range. That goes for vitamin B12. That goes for most nutrients as well. So since most of us have a deficiency, all of us should check that vitamin D blood test. And all of us should supplement appropriately. But also, I'm recommending that we actually test that VDR receptor tag to see if we need to be more particular about that than others. Okay, now... Looking at the more philosophical aspects of this, I love Cicero's comment, where, where over 2,000 years ago, Cicero said, old age must be resisted and its deficiencies supplied. This is a, this is a powerful model that I live by. You see, I want to resist age. I, I want to slow down the aging process. I want to speed up the healing process. But we can't speed up the healing process if we're not paying attention to our dysfunctional genes. If we're ignoring that, we're missing the biggest piece of the puzzle with regards to our future health or disease. And so, so, uh, so I, I've, now that we're in the era of nutrigenomic personalized care, where we now can, by proper testing, determine what, where the genetic bypass needs to occur. Okay? A corollary to Cicero's wise statement is bad genes must be detected, be resisted, and its deficiencies supplied. Well, you see, it's not just these other factors that are important. We need to pay attention to the fact that sleep deprivation is a powerful regulator of our health. And we know that as of the last studies we've seen on this, that there's at least 224 genes in our body that are negatively impacted when we don't get adequate sleep. And so we are now doing a genetic bypass. I actually, we should say a genetic block on our genes. We're creating barriers to that metabolic pathway because of poor habits relative to sleep. Make sure you pay attention to. And finally, I think it's important that we understand that our attitudes, our emotions, have a powerful influence on how our genes work. Uh, studies uh, with, with rats show that, that a loving mother rat, you know, cuddles its... its uh, uh, it's babies. And, and that cuddling process, that nurturing process from mother to uh, her, her, her little babies powerfully activates genes in the positive direction. And so we know that for us too, moms, dads, whole loving and, and, and lovingly care for your babies, for your grandbabies, for each other. Uh, this, this is why we we should not let a day go by where we're not showing love physically to somebody else, giving them a hug, giving them a firm handshake, patting them on the back, looking them in the eye, telling them how much we appreciate them. It's a powerful, powerful regulator of our genes. 
So we can actually, we can actually change even mutated genes in a positive direction by just being ambassadors of love and forgiveness to other individuals. So as, in summary, as we look at how we go about nutrigenomically bypassing defective genes, it's important to understand that the first step here is that we pay attention to a plant-based diet. The research is clear on this, that, that we should get at least 80-90% at least of our diet from what we call first-class foods. These are foods that haven't been refined or processed in any way. These are foods that, that are, are deep color, they're deep green, the reds and the purples and the yellows and the oranges. These are the vegetables and fruits and, and the legumes that have colored. You know that it's the actual color? The chemicals themselves that create the color in fruits and vegetables and legumes, etc., they are the actual regulators of the genes. Did you know that? It's not just a color. Oh, that's pretty. No, it's, it's actually medicine. And, and so we're being attracted to these colors so that we could take advantage of this gene-altering nutrient. So taking advantage of, the, of, the, of raspberries and strawberries and any type of berries. By the way, the only two foods that I'm aware of presently that have some activated methylfolate in them already are berries, fresh berries, and green leafy vegetables, deep green leafy. We're going to have the opportunity to taste some of that green leafy and berries this, uh, this evening. So take advantage of those, but recognize this, that, that the age of genomic research has taught us that sometimes even the healthiest diet in of itself, and as important and critical as it is, isn't going to do a full bypass of that gene mutation. We have to take control of our genes and see where that problem is and then make sure that we're fixing it properly through the proper testing and evaluation. And that frequently takes providing that, that specific nutrient at that specific time. So look for the, the colorful vegetables and, and fruits. And then it's key here to understand that, that um, you know, all of us have bad genes. Not most of us. All of us have not just one bad gene, but many, many bad genes. I certainly do. I know. I have a strong genetic tendency towards Alzheimer's, cancer, and heart disease. That's one of the things that makes me passionate about lifestyle medicine. I don't want to succumb to Alzheimer's, heart disease, uh, or dementias. I don't want to succumb to that. I want to, I want to be the best steward I can be because I know there's joy in experiencing health uh, throughout our lifetime. So uh, it is the choices that we make that determine our ultimate outcome. Um, there are strategies that relate to what we do about even one of these gene mutations. And just as an example, as we look at, at this, at this uh, kind of confusing slide, we see that one mutation requires paying attention to diet paying attention to the toxins that are around us, paying attention to many factors, paying attention to digestion. See, if you're not digesting food properly, our gene mutations are going to control us. We have to fix digestion. So that's why, once again, in, in the book Goodbye Diabetes, I, I, I spend a whole chapter talking about digestion. So I have patients say, wait a minute, what's the whole chapter on digestion doing in a book on diabetes? So if you don't fix digestion, you're not going to fix diabetes or any condition for that matter. Uh, so there's, there's uh, many aspects of this strategic plan that go in into properly fixing a gene mutation. Uh, as, as we're looking at the big picture, there's, there's, um, uh, there's tests, there's laboratory tests that we need to consider. There's specific nutritional bypasses that we need to consider. And so here's the key. The key was told to me, 25 years ago, by a brilliant journalist known as Norman Cousins. And I, I, I still remember his lecture. It was like I was sitting in there and just in awe of his amazing command of the English language. And he said, when it comes to health and disease, we need to understand 
that too, too many of us are afraid to test, are afraid to go to the doctor and ask certain questions about our health because we're afraid that we might find out that we have diabetes, prediabetes, high cholesterol, uh, pr this problem or that problem. We're afraid. Why? Because we're still stuck in the old paradigm that genetic flaws are unmanageable. It's wrong, folks. We need to accept the reality that we can be masters of our genes, that God has given to us an opportunity to be in control of our genes. And so he said, don't deny the diagnosis. Embrace the diagnosis. Don't, don't wait to do the appropriate testing because you're scared of what you might find out. You're scared that you might be a mutant. Let me tell you, don't be scared about that. You're all mutants. Okay, I'm a mutant, you're a mutant. Don't be scared about that because that's, that's just a reality. The key is finding out what type of mutant are we so that we can do something about it. So don't deny the diagnosis, defy the verdict. We can do something about that. And in, in ending tonight, I want to just share what one of my favorite Bible verses is. It comes from Isaiah 58. It's, a, it's an amazing read, regardless of your religious persuasion, or even if you're agnostic or atheist. It doesn't matter. This is like reading Shakespeare. This is amazing literature. And essentially, there's a promise. There's a promise in this, in this a section of, of the prophet Isaiah when he wrote, he says, I want you someday, I want you to be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. And I'll be honest with you, the first time I read that, I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> it's like I said, it's kind of like reading Shakespeare. You're like, what is that? What does that mean? But see, you see, now that we understand genetics, now that we understand this, 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 this whole new era of genomic medicine, of personalized care, we can actually go to this physical structure, this physical structure. And in, 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 in the ancient days of Israel, their temple and their city lay in ruins. And Isaiah says, you can be a repairer of that breach. You can go to that physical structure and you can repair it. You can build it up. So it's a, a, a mighty structure, a beautiful structure once again. But did you know that our bodies also are temples? Our bodies can be repaired. We have a need to repair that temple. We can be a repairer of the breach. Um, and we can restore those metabolic pathways that have been dysfunctional for so many years because of those genetic mutations. They have prevented us without realizing it to, 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 to be as optimally healthy as we could be. But now we have access to the information where each one of you can fulfill this promise, where we can be repairs of the breach and restorers of these paths so that, so that as we dwell in this land, we can be optimally healthy. And that will make all the difference in our health. Let's pray as we, as we prepare for some, some good genomic therapy. Uh, nutritional genomic therapy. Let's go ahead. Father, I'm so grateful that, that we have this wonderful information from your second book, Nature, Science. We have the opportunity to take advantage, to, to take note of this information. But Lord, help us to, more importantly, apply it effectively to our lives so that we can experience the transformational power of, of, uh, that's available to us even right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.